it's closer. Uh, oh, love, much closer. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. I love the stuff like in the. I love it. All right, do everything you just did, but better. <laughs> For all of us, at some point in our life, like we just have to wake up and decide to be real. I think and. Uh, for me, music has always been the outlet to be real. Uh, this, this album is without a doubt the most personal thing that I've ever put out. So one of the really cool things that I got to do from the very beginning was kind of be behind the scenes of everything and just kind of capture everything while it was going on and I think that you know for me that that was like that meant more to me than really playing on the album because that's my thing like that's what I'm good at and that's what God's called me to do and just to you know incorporate you know my calling into this project somehow has been really special and for it to be so personal to the both of us it was probably one of the most special things that I have uh, projects that I've worked on so far out of my whole career The process of recording this record um, was really different from anything that I've ever done because it was the first time that I had ever worked with a demo and even really recorded a demo to present to other people to say, hey, here's a drum part or here's a string part. Yeah. I want to add one on that because I like to check it. Well, that like that's what, like, I would do it on the last one and keep one of them straight, or maybe yeah. do like so. Do what? What? What do you want to do? So do maybe do like so as whole like. So once the songs were recorded in demo format, I would then present it to. Um, all of the other players um, and really my wife Beth and my good friend Tabor they were kind of my co-producers I guess they were the ones that I would constantly bounce all the ideas off of and they'd be like yeah that's awesome or, no, that sucks and I'd be like oh, okay back to the drawing board <laughs>
I had just reached a point to where like, I, I don't know, my life had to be something different than, you know, just what I had done my whole life up until that point. So really the beginning of this project was me honestly just trying to get away from everything that I had been a part of. Uh, and that's the first time that I think I've ever said that, but that's okay. Like, even though, like, this all started out as me trying to get away from what I had known um, up until now. But really, this project has brought me closer to God than what I have ever been in my life, I think. Um, you know, even growing up in church and in an amazing church family and uh, in an amazing family, like... This, this was my way of finding home. This was my way of finding purpose. And I truly think that I have found my purpose, um, my calling, and I've never, you know, we go through life and as we go through school, high school, college, like, you know, we can major in something, but then we, you know, go into the second and third year of whatever, and we end up changing a major. It's the same thing with life. Like, you know, one day you might want to be a doctor, and then you want to be a musician or whatever. And I've always bounced back and forth on, like, what do I need to do in life? What, you know, if music is my thing, what avenue of music is my thing. I went to school to be an audio engineer. I've been a worship leader for many, many years now. Um, but it wasn't until this project that, like, I, God really revealed to me, okay, here, like, this is what you need to do. And it is to spread hope and encourage and um, I'm dodging potholes and just show people love, God's love, real love in the truest way possible. I just think that people need this. I think people need real. I think that we're in a time right now where people are starting to see what really matters and what's most important and um, they're starting to see their relationship with God is important and um, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. He doesn't expect us to be something that we're not. He expects us to need Him and completely give everything to Him and that's what you know we're kind of doing in this whole album is just Giving it back to God and saying, "This is what this we trust you. This is we know you're doing a good work in us, and we know that we need to change the world, and this is how we're going to do it."
you bring it back up? I got it raising off the ground. Oh. So the doors won't open. The only thing you've ran so far is kick in. Yeah. So this is the par room. I'm just going to feed it to you and I'll take it out just so you can hear it. So, I mean, it's pretty impressive. For the drums, once we had once I had kind of had the bare bones of drum parts demoed, um, I presented it to Jake Ratliff and Caleb Hall. They're the guys that played all the drums and all the percussion on the record, and they absolutely killed it. And we um, went to this 100-year-old church that's huge, huge ceilings. It's really, really long. And uh, we kind of took a chance because I didn't exactly know what it sounded like in there, what the room sounded like. Um, but we talked to the pastor and we were like, hey, can we like come walk through it and check it out and, you know, shout real loud and see what it sounds like or something. And, uh, and like instantly whenever I walked in, I was like, okay, like this is where we have to record drums and strings and everything else that we can. From start to finish, the entire record is one story, but how do you continue to tell that story when there are no words? Like, like specific instrumentals are strategically placed throughout the album because it's the progression of the story, but how do you tell that? Like, is it you play big loud parts or it's your entire part was a cymbal swell and that was literally all you did like but how do you add to that how do you how do you tell that story like in that musical yes you know, like you have to figure that out and we, that was all of our process was how do we help tell the story and that was you know I mean we we've been talking and eating way too much Mexican food, talking about this album for years and, you know, dreaming of like how it would sound. And there were multiple times where it was like, I figured it all out, we're doing it. And then you come back literally three days later and we're sitting in the same booth in the same Mexican restaurant and you go, scratch it. I've decided that it's not this. And, but, but having that backstory of, you know, you just in your whole process of thinking, like every time you think something new, it was just like, Here's my ideas, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't know how it's gonna work. But that's what I always say is you give Brennan time to think and it gets dangerous. It gets dangerous. <laughs> when I first heard the demos, I started thinking, man, what am I gonna do? <laughs> Because it's just overwhelming at the time. I wasn't expecting it to be so intricate. Because I started listening to everything. I was like, man, there's like a million things going on. It's like counting this is going to be crazy and just learning it and trying to retain it. But like that's the part of the fun and the challenge. And it's nice because I don't get that as much anymore with the, you know, the, one of the other projects I play with, which I love playing, you know, the standard 4-4 four -four stuff. But it's nice every once in a while to go in and yeah, experiment with time and you know sounds and all that stuff. It's nice, but it was it was it was a little, little scary at first, but it was totally worth it and it was amazing. Once we had the drums, it was much easier to write and arrange the final string parts. And I have to give like massive props to Nathan Bailey for transcribing all of the craziness that I sent to him for the strings. If it wasn't for him, uh, it probably wouldn't have worked. <laughs> uh, so Nathan, you killed it. There was like limited talking about the part. Like, and that was the first interaction that I've ever really had with that. They just, they knew what was on the page. They had listened to the music 
and they just did it. Like, it was insane. It was the craziest thing that I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, it just, it, it just sounds totally different than that. It's a very, I feel like it's a very modern approach to, you know, Appalachian music because while, you know, you guys are over here in this side, part of the country, um, like, it doesn't sound like typical Appalachian stuff. And it just has a more modern vibe and current and, but very unique. I don't know, there's so many words. I think I listen to it more than anybody first, so I arrange the music for it. <laughs> yeah. So at first, I just went through listening to the songs and trying to pick out like all the different instruments, so I could like I thought about it way more like analytical first before I ever thought about like what is this music. But then after I you know had to listen to it over and over and over again, and I finally got the chance to like listen to, to it for what it was, and I just kept finding myself like singing along constantly, like even to all the instrumental parts, the vocal parts, everything. And uh, I think that whenever I first got it, it was missing some vocal parts even, but still it was just like super catchy, like really fun to listen to. But it's also like so different in every song. Um, the versions that I got had the songs together when they're like fade in together. And I think that really like helps. It's like every song is different, but it's a story wow. all together. From there, I knew on one song in particular, Skirmish, there needed to be a pretty intense like lead piano, and I totally didn't have the chops to do it at that point in time, not that I do now, but so I called up my good friend Drew Stumbo, and I was like, hey, here's a tune, would you be interested in, you know, playing and and he immediately fell in love with the tune and he was like, yeah, let's get together and do some stuff. And uh, yeah, so Drew Stumbo played all of the lead piano parts on Skirmish and he totally killed it. While we're talking about keyboards, I guess, um, we could talk about Tony Mullins. This whole record and this whole project in general has really been made and developed in the spirit of collaboration. And one essential part that we had to have, and it was actually one of the last things that we recorded, uh, was Tony Mullins on organ. We just spent the day together. He listened to the songs, charted them out, but we kind of, um, the organ parts that are on the record, we were kind of just making them up as we went. Um, and, and that was a very freeing way to go about it, I think, for me and him both. In building each of these tracks, each of these tunes, I had worked in some horn parts and specifically some saxophone parts. You know, just toying around with the idea and switching those parts to, uh, you know, another instrument, a dulcimer or something, just to see what timbre would fit within the track. And then uh, on a few tunes, Finding Home and, and uh, not fall for sure i kept coming back to saxophone and i was like man i don't really know many saxophone players but there was there's this guy that i had worked with in the past um eric wurzelbacher and he his musical knowledge is just unreal he's he's just a crazy talented person and so i was extremely excited when he agreed to come onto the project. And I drove up to Cincinnati and, uh, and we tracked saxophone for a day. If I had to pick 
a favorite part of the record. It would probably have to be the tail end of Aftermath. I presented Eric with this. I just had this little piano line written, just extremely straightforward. And my friend Tabor, he was there too. And I was like, okay, between the three of us, let's like do something crazy here. Uh, I think we have like uh, four or five different saxophone parts playing at the tail end of that song. And just all of that combined is just like, just, it's just crazy. There's just so much depth in there. And yeah, so that's Eric. He completely crushed it. Aftermath was definitely one of my favorite songs on the album, especially after Eric absolutely obliterated the saxophone part. But when we wrote it, um, the sax wasn't in there and it was just, just the melody pretty much. And um, we, we knew you know, that right after Skirmish, this was this huge battle that was just coming to a halt and it was just calm it was relaxing but it was so it was almost still really foggy and i always imagined this girl just walking down the road and all around her was just all this debris and all this stuff that was just clouding like her her vision and like everything in front of her it was like she was trying to find something um to just relax in, just to like just to be in a moment for just a minute and just totally release and um, I feel like it's not something that we could have done just sitting down and saying hey these are the lyrics it was something that we had to feel and it was when we recorded it and wrote it at the same time so I was able to you know listen to this melody in my head and just and just come up with you know okay so this is this line this is this line and you know just how the song flowed in general and um, I feel like if we hadn't done it that way, that we wouldn't have got this the rawness of it and the rawness of the feeling that this person has went through and, and even Brennan himself. And um, when, we, when we finished it, we were like, oh man, that's it. Like, that's totally it. We knew it had to be something just really calm and breathy and just to really capture, you know, just the purity of it and just like, all right, I'm gonna just settle down in this moment and just stop and just listen. And I feel like it was probably the best way we could have captured it. Through this whole demoing, writing, recording process, I would kind of always go back to my friend Tabor Mullins and he would kind of give me direction whenever I didn't really know what to do or I was like, hey, does this suck? And he'd be like, ah, yep. And I'd be like, oh, okay, well, I'll write something else. <laughs> and, uh, but we would like constantly be working together and he actually played bass on pretty much every song um, and some keyboard synth parts too and all of the guitar, the lead guitar parts on the record is him. He just, he's an unreal musician. His ear is just crazy good, and he's just a very, very musical person. I felt like I became your external hard drive. You know what I mean? Like uh, anything you needed to get rid of up here, 
I was like, I'll store it, you know what I mean? And that way, um, I don't know. I mean, the more I knew, the more I could help, I guess. And um, I mean, what, not anything like, not music related, but I mean, music related too, you know what I mean? Like the same thing, like, cause you had ideas and we were bouncing stuff off each other. It goes back to the thing where I was like, hey, I remember telling you that. I was like, I want you to be dry. This is your baby. This is your adventure. This is your journey. But you know, every Batman's got a Robin, so you can drive the ship, but as long as I'm pulling a freaking rope or helping doing something, <laughs> you know what I mean? I was, uh, but yeah, I felt like, that's how I felt though. Like in, the, in a good way, like I felt like this like cool external hard drive for the coolest computer ever, you know what I mean? Getting to like absorb all this stuff and help out with it. Um, but yeah, I just remember basically going, oh crap. Brennan's about to, he's about to have his Van Gogh moment where he's eating paint. <laughs> he goes crazy and makes a massive, you know, something. But, yeah, I mean, that's really, I don't know. I mean, I remember, like, non-collective related stuff almost more. Because, I mean, like you said, sitting on top of the world was the only thing that was written at the time. I mean, I remember, like, weird stuff. Like, I remember driving to Wendy's. <laughs> that's where I was going. It was, like, raining and stuff like that. Going, no, what? What's the fire? Fire? What's the right now? If I had to sum up the project in the one word? Yeah. Oh, cinematic. That's like the best word for it. This whole thing is, I mean, you would, I use the word cinematic. I feel like you would use the word journey. And, but that's the difference between me and you is this has been your journey. This has been my silver screen and got to watch it all happen. You know what I mean? So for me, it's cinematic because I got to, I basically got to watch, but you're the one on the screen, you know what I mean? So I think that's why you would say journey. I feel like we've really, like, I don't know, broke new ground for the future. Yeah. Um, this being like the first real project, uh, that collective has done um, yeah I mean it's just really everyone who's been involved it's just really like paved the way for what the next step is and uh, even though we're not really sure about that right now um, it's uh, you know just building relationships and finding the right people that need to be involved um, that's just helping us move forward. I guess the timeline of the project was really, and, and this is what makes me excited about the future. Really, this project was super focused on my life. Um, and yes, like mine and Beth's life, kind of in some of the songs, but it really focuses on my life from like 2013, um, pretty much up until this massive vacation that Beth and I took out west. And um, and so, without really knowing, that is the next phase of the story. And I know that Beth is going to have a lot more to say on the next record. And, and in the future because, you know, the storyline of Finding Home brought us kind of to the point of us getting together and getting married and 
starting our lot. I'm really excited for the next project <laughs> and to see what happens in our life and to see where God takes Beth and I and everyone else that's joined us on this massive journey. Journeys are what shape us and mold us into the person that we want to be and the person that we're becoming. The wider path might seem easier, like you have more room to breathe and grow, but it's the narrow path, the harder path, that takes you to the place of purpose, where you're supposed to be. It might be more treacherous, and you might fight more battles, but you'll know when you get there. You've found it. Lauren, that I've been trying for 26 years. <laughs> well, I just, I mean, it's weird because I just realized in these moments that my face is either smiling or I'm doing this. That's okay. <laughs> What do you think, Jake? I think that's, that's <laughs> awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>